Do you know that the combat aircraft in the US Air Force are less than 43% of the total? And I'm not even counting the drones? I always wanted to do a rather simple analysis. What is the tooth to tail ratio in major air forces? I use the vertex of human knowledge, that is Wikipedia, to, to crunch some numbers and see the results. I did not consider UAVs because under this category there are very different machines that are not comparable. So the United States Air Force has 42.5% combat aircraft, 23.4% trainers and 15.3% transports. The DKS, the Russian Air Force, has 42.1% combat aircraft, 37.9% helicopters and 11.4% transports. The PLAF, the Chinese Air Force, has 68% combat aircraft, 19.4% trainers, and 8.7% transports. As you can see, there are several differences in compositions. US and Russia have similar percentage of combat aircraft, but the Russians have few dedicated trainers, but a lot of helicopters. The Chinese break this pattern and have a preponderance of combat aircraft. There are several considerations that we could do, but in this video I am focusing on a specific line in the table. The one labeled OAX ISR C3. That is, all those aircraft whose mission is to use sensors or to provide command, control and communications to other aircraft. The US has 178 aircraft in service, that is 3.5% of the total. The Russians have 64 aircraft in service before the war for a 1.6% of the total. The Chinese have 114 aircraft for a 3.4% of the total. These aircraft are not very well known, but they bring to the table an array of relatively unsexy but essential capabilities. And when I say essential, I don't mean essential to exert air power or to conduct air operation, at least not only for that. They are sometimes essential to orient the foreign politics of entire nations, or they are essential to preserve a form of control in case of a nuclear escalation, or at the other end of the spectrum, they are essential to coordinate the response to natural di disasters. In fact, they are often referred to as force multipliers. Their presence greatly improves the effectiveness of the combat aircraft and the other kinetic assets involved in operations. This video is dedicated to them, but we won't go through all the models, the variants, the capabilities. What we want to understand is why do they act as multipliers, and in doing so, we will dive deep into some rather dark and little known aspects of air warfare. So, grab a cup or a glass of your favorite drink and let's get started. Your espresso cup is empty, sir. Yes, Otis, because otherwise I would risk spraying the computer, the audio board, the, the TV and mic and all the other stuff that there is around here. Of course it's empty. Everybody knows the E3 AWACS, its strange appearance makes it an iconic aircraft. Its large radar is a very familiar sight. But how many do know that the aircraft is an essential communication node, connecting the aircraft in the theater with the common centers anywhere else in the world? How many could list from memory all the electronic-related variants of the humble C-12, like the MC-12W, for example? How many do really know anything about the U-28 Draco, whose job is to provide the essential radio and real-time video link between special forces in the field and command and control centers on the other side of the world? These capabilities are provided by the use of several different types of sensors and communication systems. Radars are the most familiar, but the radar imagery must become a digital record of the real-time air situation and it must be disseminated to be processed and redistributed to be really useful. 
Synthetic Aperture Radar on board of aircraft and drones can do the same thing with the ground situation, often with resolutions that reach few centimeters. Moving target indicators filters can track the moving objects, painting a dynamic picture of the situation. Electro-optic and infrared sensors do provide imagery that can be processed either manually or automatically to extract meaningful information. Or SIGINT or signal intelligence is the capability of listening and interpreting electromagnetic emissions, either communications related, which is comment, or of other nature, in this case is called ELINT. The distinction between the two is somehow starting to blur today, but the concept still stands. All of them, today, are equipped with some sort of data link to exchange highly structured information in near real time. But once you have collected all these data, you're just at the beginning. The next step is turning these data into something useful for planners and combatants. That is, information. Reconnaissance and information war for centuries were always considered an important aspect of the military art. Their importance though kept growing and in modern days ISR is a fundamental element of military operations and resource management. The reason for this growth are simple. Speed, range and complexity. Modern assets can operate at high speed, and I mean not only physical speed. Targeting loops have become quicker. System can generate a high volume of lethal fire in a much shorter time. Precision weapons are not only fast, but also so effective to apply a lot of firepower very accurately and in a short time. And if everything moves fast on the battlefield, even more so in the air above it. This means that the old system of pointing something, firing a projectile to something else, is obsolete. To hit a fast moving target, you need the information to intercept it. And this piece of information is usually more complex than, look, it's there. The modern battlefield is also huge. Assets and weapons range exceed any human ability to see and identify targets. In general, the farther is a target, the more difficult it is to detect it, identify it, and acquire the information to actively target it. The modern battlefield is also very complex because modern systems are more complex. The flip side of technological advance is complexity. And the flip side of specialization is complexity. The increase in the variety and complexity of the assets means also an increase of spares, different training, different procedures, different suppliers, different logistic chains, and every increase in this complexity is the harbinger of further complexity to manage this complexity. Maybe you didn't realize, but I'm talking about complexity. Command and logistics centers proliferate and increase the vulnerability of the organization, creating centers of gravity that, if destroyed, can cause a disproportionate damage. If you destroy the only two factories that overhaul your opponent's tube artillery, sooner or later the opponent will run out of tube artillery. At least this is the theory that leads some air forces to think that they can win wars by themselves, but this is a different video. Obviously, you need to know where these centers of gravity are, what do they do, and how to make them inoperable. And with the growth of these factors, the complexity of the information required to characterize and eventually engage these targets has increased as well. As you may have surmised, this is a tremendously complex subject that would require entire books, uh, university semesters, and people smarter than me to be covered in any possible detail. What I'm trying to do is to give an idea of the problems involved. Hey Chief, hey Chief, the aircraft just flew above me. I don't know exactly, it could be a model XY35, but could also be an AD22. And uh, where I am, I'm uh, a couple of kilometers south of a place called Gengglundung, or Gengglundung, yeah, something like that, something like that, yeah? 
If I was human, I would consider that cringer worthy, sir. This is what, for most human history, militaries had to deal with. Some may think this is a valid data point, as they are often called today. No, they are not. This is what is called unstructured data. A human can do something with it, but it is difficult to transmit, record, replicate, and crucially analyze. And in fact, military organizations try to formalize these communications in standard packages. An example is the 9-liner. This is a standard format that a ground controller may use to provide a close air support aircraft with the information to hit the, a target. It contains position, elevation, direction, a description, and so on. It is still words, and it is generally transmitted over a voice communication, but it is a good example of a standardization. Things are obviously more complex with data acquired by sensors. A flying target has six degrees of freedom, three angles, and three spatial components. And since it will be somewhere, the three spatial components will likely be three coordinates. Plus, it has six speed components, triangular and trilinear. Plus, it has six acceleration components, triangular and trilinear. All these measures have errors because every measure has intrinsic errors, and a measure without an assessment of the error is basically worthless. All these numbers, then, are measured in a frame of reference that could be the target frame, the sensor frame, something else's frame, and so on. For example, a radar returns data in the frame of reference of the sensors, and they need to be translated in the frame of reference of the command center receiving them to be useful. So you need information about the reciprocal position of the radar and the command center to do so, and the position of both in respect of anything else. And then you have information about the target. What is it? If it is an aircraft of which type, is it friend, foe, neutral? Is it to be classed as a threat or not? As before, all these pieces of information are associated with a measure of incertitude, which is often expressed using some statistic formalisms. The aircraft type, for example, is expressed as a table where every entry has two associated percentages. This target has 73% possibility of being a Sohoi 27, and I am 85 confident that I am right. Uh, this seems complicated at first sight, but it isn't. Think of this conversation. It could be A or B or D, but surely not C. But I could be wrong, and it is actually an E. A, B, and D are each one at 33% probability, C is at 0%, but you're only 50% sure that it is A, B, or D, because there is a 50% possibility that it is an E with 100% confidence. Easy. This is the conversation that I heard humans have in front of captures, sir. Uh, if you're interested to go deeper about this subject, you can watch the series about the F-35 systems, where it is discussed in some detail. Now, once you have turned unstructured data into structured data, you are just at the beginning. You have to communicate these data, that is, make them available to those who need them. And to put them to use, you have to analyze them, that is, turn them into information that can be used to take a decision and act. There may be several different ways of storing these data with different formats incompatible among them. So the data collected by a system may not be interpretable by another. Literally apparently stupid situations like using slightly different names and lengths could be a source of incompatibility. If a system calls an aircraft type A34 and the other type A space 34 with a space, this could be enough to make the two incompatible and the data can be exchanged. It is obviously a problem that can be fixed, it happens every day, of course, but the price is further complexity and lower reliability. And even the radio or the digital communications are a source of complexity. Not all the equipment is interoperable. There are different radios, communication protocols, and data links. For example, most military radios are encrypted, and the encryption may not work with the radios of the other services or the radio of other nations. All these problems make the management of the information a massive headache that requires a lot of resources to make it work. I remember an interview with a NATO air commander involved in the operations in ex-Yugoslavia complaining that he needed at least a dozen different 
pieces of software installed on his laptop to be able to communicate with all the assets under his command. So, once you have managed to collect all of your information somewhere, when you manage to overcome all the communication issues, which you never do completely, when you have gathered together a group of people who are expert analysts, this is when the problem begins. Because these people will have several sources of information, some pretty common like TV and traditional media, some will be written reports, some will be the data coming in from sensors, some will be multimedia, in this day and age also social media, but the end result is not different. This is a mess. They will need a way to work on this mass and or mess of information, extract insight and redistribute it in a way that could be used by the rest of the force. If the headquarter knows that an offensive is coming, but the guys on the ground don't, well, you're off to a bad start. More recently, in the last decade or so, a lot of effort has been poured into fast-scale chains on the battlefield. That is, using the information acquired by a sensor to immediately trigger a kinetic reaction and guiding the kinetic weapon by sensors not necessarily co-located with the launcher. A famous recent example is a joint exercise where an F-35 provided engageable tracks on the ground to the US Army artillery that quickly simulated the fire on them. The same aircraft type provided tracks of a short-range ballistic weapons to be engaged by the Army's air defenses. But there are several other examples, like the same F-35 guiding a SM-2 missile launched by a ship, or the AWACS aircraft providing mid-course guidance to the most recent Amram variants. On the Russian side, for example, the active radar homing S-400 missiles can receive guidance from the A-50 AWACS aircraft. Each of the elements mentioned above go under the umbrella name of network-centered warfare. As we said, it is an incredibly vast subject and it would require much more than YouTube videos to be covered in any decent detail. However, the underlying idea is that the strict cooperation of assets based on the automated the near real-time exchange of information is going to be much more effective than the sum of its parts. And in fact, all the assets that we listed at the beginning, all the aircraft that we listed at the beginnings, are often called force multipliers. This is a concept that was born during the Cold War, when NATO forces were expected to fight in constant numeric inferiority. The idea was to improve the effectiveness not by matching the numbers, but by improving the effectiveness of the single systems. Looking at all these aircraft dedicated in a way or another to the acquisition of the information and its management, you may have one legitimate question. Why place all of this on an aircraft? An aircraft has a limited payload, a limited endurance, and it can become very vulnerable if anything goes wrong. Is it the best place? Well, there are a few reasonably good reasons, and a crucial one. Since we are talking about aircraft and we are talking about air forces, it is not surprising that most of these assets are installed on aircraft. Actually, the opposite would be surprising. To be honest, Russians and Chinese have a more developed ground component than NATO, but we are still talking aircraft here, so yeah, let's keep talking aircraft. NATO and the US in particular are configured to be an expeditionary force capable of relocating everywhere in the world. In this case, placing most of the systems on flying platforms makes sense. Even in peacetime, and actually mostly during peacetime, all air forces conduct intelligence operations to acquire information about neighboring potential adversaries. For electronic intelligence, platforms that can move in international waters or airspace are the obvious choice. And indeed everyone who can does that. Because every device emitting electromagnetic waves can, in principle, be listened. Some much more than others, but this is an entirely different video. But there is a reason that is grounded in physical reality, but I know it may be highly controversial. The Earth is round. The propagation of electromagnetic waves is not as simple as it may seem, but in general anything from the VHF radio and above, let's say 2 MHz and above, requires line of sight. Reflections and diffractions may help, but every emitting or listening device working at high frequency requires line of sight. However, 
non line of sight communications do exist and they are for example submarines use extremely low frequencies because these do penetrate to a certain depth they can be used even to transmit digital information but their bandwidth is very limited in general, to implement the kind of information management required in network-centric warfare where cables are not available, high frequencies are required, and when high frequencies are involved, line of sight is needed. Sending an aircraft high enough to have a large horizon increases the range of communications as well. This is the reason why sensors and communication systems are implemented on aircraft. There is also one obvious alternative to an aircraft flying high, which is placing sensors and communications assets in space. Up there, you tend to have a pretty large horizon. For example, the horizon of a satellite in geostationary orbit is about one third of the globe. And in fact, the use of space-based assets is becoming increasingly common for ISR and communication tasks. There is a real proliferation ongoing right now, but this is beyond the scope of the video. What is not beyond the scope is how these assets contribute to the final result. Did you ever think about the process of organizing an air campaign? Even a relatively simple one like a round of training missions is a very complex task. Air forces in the world have varying degrees of experience on the subject and different organizational levels. What we are interested in here is not to go through this process in detail, but to understand how the management of the information collected by these systems is integral to the management of the air campaign. The NATO approach is very structured and it is generally conceived as an iterative process with five major conceptual steps. The translation of the overall mission concept in a mission plan, the acquisition of the intelligence required to execute the plan and the identification of the opponent's centers of gravity, a targeting process that matches information and forces with the targets identified above, an higher tasking cycle to make efficient use of the assets available, and finally, all these must be supported by an appropriate common control communication, computers and intelligence, C4I for short, to enable all the previous steps. This is the place where conceptually all these assets that we have just described fit in. They are the essential backbone that support all these activities. The output of this process is a combination of various different plans, among which the air task in order used to be the one with the most immediate impact. Written in a standard format, it defines the who, when, and where of the air operations. While other plans, like the air operations plan, describe the how, the ATO is the orchestrator of the actual operations. Its dissemination is so important that it has been codified as a computer format using the XML language. And I know this phrase will be illuminating for those who know how markup languages like SML are used in civilian IT. For those who don't, the important bit is that the ATO can be codified in a specific computer-readable format. Hence, it can be used by a computer system, for example, to maintain and disseminate the progress of the plan to the different interested parties. We will get back to this later. The information included in the ATO are, for example, mission number, aircraft type and number, unit, call sign, ordnance required, target and time over target. There is some additional information such as identification codes used for electronically identifying aircraft, exact desired mean points of impact for weapons and remarks used to convey specific instruction from the commanding staff. There are specific pieces of software that assist in the creation of the ATO, like the BI systems ATOPS, which fuse data and help producing a detailed ATO and assist in its execution. The NATO standard was a 72 hours planning and a 48 hours tasking cycle. It means that under normal conditions, it takes three days from the identification of a target to the target being hit. This approach, despite the success, started to be called in question during the storm because it happened to be too inflexible. As we said at the beginning, everything is becoming faster and 72 hours are just too long. 
and the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the ATO still existed for pre-planned high-importance targets, but most of the missions were directed toward areas where a target could appear or there were ground forces that might have required support. The planning cycle for one of these targets was reduced to about 45 minutes in case of contingencies even less than that. And at the end of the war, only 20% of the targets hit was hit by missions generated by the traditional ATO. Today, the emphasis is in the production of a master air attack plan that is used to generate an ATO and an airspace control order, which is the plan to protect and manage the available airspace to avoid the conflicts and incidents, which still tend to happen. But anyway, the ATO still exists, but the missions are often designed with the flexibility of making an asset available in flight or on call to quickly react to the battle space conditions. As a, as a side note, multi-role aircraft like those in service with NATO are particularly suited to this type of employment, while aircraft that tend to be less multi-role, more single-use, like Chinese or Russian, are sort of less suited to this type of approach. The inspiring underlying principle is centralized planning, but decentralized execution. The local or the airborne commander has the authority to divert a mission or decide how to use the assets available as long as these decisions comply with the map and the commander's intent. Listen, I know that all this stuff may seem overly bureaucratic and not really related with the reality of the battlefield. I agree, it is boring. However, the details of the processes behind the execution are a key component of the overall success or failure of a campaign. The process innovation is an invisible element that can happen without big and flashy hardware being involved, but it can do quite a lot to improve the overall effectiveness of an entire Air Force. I spent quite a lot of time reading academic papers, official publication, doctrinal publication, but the evolution is quick and fast. So today, in 2023, there may be differences that I couldn't identify in my research. Only those on the front line really know what is going on. So if you are one of those guys and you can talk, only if you can, please let us know in the comments below. What is beyond any doubt, though, is that this process is entirely fueled by the information collected and managed by those rather obscure assets that we have discussed at the beginning. Those in the know may have noticed that I never mentioned once who is in charge. That is, the Joint Force Air Component Commander. That is because the acronym is JFAC, which makes me wonder who makes these acronyms. So far we have talked about United States and NATO, but what about Russia and China? Well, it is difficult to assess Russia and China's development in this area. We have access to far fewer Russian and Chinese documents than Western ones. We have to reconstruct the military thinking mostly from fragmented pieces of news that appear here and there in the international press. Since the beginning of the operations in Ukraine, accessing the Russian internet has become quite difficult too, so no mil.ru. However, it is not out of place covering the two together somehow, because the foundation in both cases is the Soviet doctrine. I'm not saying that they're still organized as the Soviet. Actually, both of them has moved on a long, long way from what it was. I am saying that in both cases, their history is characterized by the effort of moving away from the same heritage. In this video, we will focus mostly on Russia because more information has emerged thanks to the events in Ukraine. We have already covered the operations and the training of the Chinese Air Force on the channel, but we will get back to the subject in another occasion. As we said, both Russia and China had the same starting point. Every aspect of the mission was pre-planned. The mission planning included all sorts of details. The aircraft was expected to reach a specific point at a specific altitude and speed, releasing the weapons in a specific sequence, and so on. 
every step was guided by a ground controller and it required a specific verbal authorization from the ground. For example, in the 50s and the 60s, when overflying the Soviet Union was still possible for NATO reconnaissance assets, Soviet aircraft followed the Western aircraft only till the boundary of their area of competence, and then they invariably turned back even when there was no other aircraft ready to shadow the intruder. Why? Because that was the procedure. The Chinese kept flying in this way till the early 90s and even later. The Soviets, though, realized pretty soon that this way of flying was not really effective, and in the 70s they started a series of improvements like the Kavkaz program, the Exercise 500, and the creation of the training center at the Air Base 1521. But this is a story for another time. This partial change of attitude was supported by a concurrent technological development. The Soviets had had rudimentary data links since the late 50s. For example, the P-35 anti-ship missile could receive simple mid-course guidance instructions in flight from the launcher or from a Tupolev 95 aircraft flying within range. In the mid-60s, the first Soviet AWAC Center service, uh, the first being the Tupolev 126 MOS. The aircraft communications were mostly voice, but it started operating the first data links with the ground based centers. Fast forward, the MiG 31 was designed since the beginning with the full capability of sharing the radar picture with all other aircraft flying in the same area and to download to other interceptors the fire solution. A MiG-31 could act as the quarterback of a group of less capable interceptors, like the MiG-23 for example, and this was a world first. Even today, modern Russian aircraft retain this capability. The commander of a flight of Su-30s or Su-35s can assign the targets to the other wingmen completely electronically and even control the wingmen's weapons. The 2126 MOS was replaced in the late 80s by the more capable Beriev A50 mainstay. Besides being a great improvement in detection range and sensitivity, the A50 featured a data link system comparable with the contemporary Western systems in performance. However, the relatively low signal processing capability limited the ability of the aircraft, in the early variants at least, to track more than 50 targets or guide more than 12 fighters. The current Russian variant, the A50U, currently used in Ukraine, definitely seems to be more capable in this respect. Another key element of the Russian information management lineup are the many variants of the Ilyushin 20 and Ilyushin 22 aircraft. Albeit not available in large numbers, these are the backbone or the VKS intelligence effort. There are flying common posts, alien aircraft, and electronic warfare variants. So, despite the fact that we don't have a clear picture of the Russian network-centric capabilities, it is clear that they have the problem well in focus and they have worked on it. The relatively low number of assets compared to US and China is partially compensated by the use of really advanced ground-based radars capable of spotting a target over the horizon, a technology where the Russians have invested a lot. It seems unlikely that they have the same level of interoperability and common capability as the US and NATO, but the war in Ukraine seems to have stimulated a rather important revision of methodologies and procedures. You know, the, the VKS and its VVS component are born from the ashes of the Soviet forces. The decadence of the 90s, a time when Russia suffered horribly during the transition to a market economy, has left an indelible mark on the Russian Air Force. The reconstruction of the capabilities started in the mid-2000s had to prioritize some missions over others, and the focus was on the defense of the airspace. The VVS is an eminently defensive force. I know that it sounds absurd in the light of the events of the last couple of years, but this was the situation. The air-to-ground was sort of neglected. Strategic operations were left to the long-range aviation with long-range missiles. Closer support and moving targets were mostly left to the helicopters. Fixed-wing aircraft were supposed to attack stationary targets, but always acting in support of the ground forces. 
the Russian Air Force did nothing that they could win a war without the ground forces. Things started to change in Syria. The operations began in 2015, and it was a seminal moment for the Russians. The entire campaign was a gigantic experiment where a flood of new weapons were tested, but also new operation modes were trialed for the first time. For example, the Russians managed to rotate crews and ground personnel to keep a very high operational tempo. The Su-24s and the Su-35s were capable of executing up to six missions a day for many days in a row. Obviously, not all the experiments were successful. For example, the naval aviation campaign was basically a disaster. However, the overall experience convinced the Russians that the time was mature for a change of tack. In a speech in 2019, Gerasimov, the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation, underlined how air power had to have an increasing importance in Russian operations acting at all levels. Problem is, they didn't have the time. The operations in Ukraine, whose preparation actually started at the end of 2021, sidelined this process at the very beginning. We all know the story of how the Russian Air Force did attempt an air campaign during the first week of the war, with in-depth penetration in the western part of Ukraine, only to progressively retire under the coverage of their own air defenses when Ukrainians managed to restore their air defenses. One important capability that was not tested in Syria was the destruction of air defenses, and it came back to bite the Russians. And the other capability that was not tested was the coordination with their own air defenses, and particularly those operated by the ground forces. And this by the Russians even worse. I have seen various estimates, but friendly fire may account to between a quarter and a half of the total Russian losses. What they did very well, though, was to protect the airspace above the occupied territory. And which is not surprising, since it was the mission they trained for, for a couple of decades. We don't really know how the Russian equivalent of the air tasking order is developed. However, we have seen a relatively quick planning process. In the first months of the war, the Ilyushin 20Ms flew missions along the Ukrainian borders to collect intelligence during the day, and the targets were attacked during the night. It is actually a planning cycle of few hours. Initially, the planning included fixed wing tactical aircraft and cruise missiles, but later it shifted to only long-range weapons. So while it seems that they were capable of operating rather quickly, the areas where the Russians were lacking in the information warfare were more related to the capability of collecting intelligence. This led to the waste of several ammunitions attacking wrong targets or hitting civilian objectives by mistake, because I don't believe that the Russians are so stupid to waste a million dollar missile just to attack a block of flats because this will demoralize the population. They made quite a lot of collateral damage. I'm not discounting that be because of poor intelligence or lack of accuracy. And this is tragic, but unfortunately, it happens during a war. At the beginning of the war, the Russians relied on the Suhoi 24s as a reconnaissance aircraft for BDA, but when the airspace above the Ukrainian forces was progressively closed, these missions became basically too dangerous. The Russian Air Force has greatly reduced the number of attack missions in 2023, and the time has been spent reorganizing the units and introducing new weapons in sizable numbers, like the GPS-guided bombs. In the last few weeks, in the aftermath of the Ukrainian offensive, we have seen a very reactive Russian Air Force. Again, we don't know what the actual process is, but it seems that even moving targets are quickly engaged, even if it doesn't seem that an equivalent of the NATO planning on the fly is in existence. So the overall judgment is the Russians are learning and they're developing the technologies and the methodologies to apply the air power more effectively. They always had a clear focus on what today we call network-centric warfare, but for various reasons they have always been at least one step behind the West. But this doesn't mean that they're not trying and they're not improving. Considering that they are going to have more war experience than anyone else when this war will be over, whatever is going to remain of the Russian Air Force will be a force to consider. And trust me, I'm saying this without a shadow of satisfaction. 
Thank you very much for getting this far in the video. This was another long video and I hope it was interesting for you. Please do the usual YouTube stuff like uh, subscribe and uh, click the bell because the algorithm hasn't been particularly good with me recently and so any form of help is really appreciated. In particular, you can really help the channel by clicking on the videos that are going to appear at the very end. Because there are more than 300 videos on the channel, I believe that you will find something else interesting to watch if you like this video. An enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon, by one of donations, by being members. I bring you all in my heart. You have no idea how important you are and how grateful I am to have you here. Another thing that you can do is buy a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link in the links below. I have a small percentage and there is no extra cost for you. So, again, Thank you very, very much for watching and see you next time.